All right, let's let's do this. We're going to start early, and uh, I don't get it. Someone timed my sermon. I think I usually my sermon was the same length as all my other sermons, but maybe because I didn't throw in as many stories or something, it was a lot shorter. Somebody said, and we had short hymns, so we finished kind of early. We have extra time today, and uh, and so that's good. It'd be really nice to finish chapter one, and I want to get to this stuff toward the end of the of the chapter. Well, let's uh. Let's sing a song first to start out. So we'll, if we get to it, I want to talk a little about angels. Here in the, uh, angels are in many places in the book of Revelation. So there's a, there's a song that's really simple. So I'll sing it the first time and then we'll sing it a couple more times and you have to join in. And no doing this. <laughs> what a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. Angels bow before him, heaven and earth adore him. What a mighty God we serve. Isn't that simple? Yeah. <laughs> All right, so you can you can do it. So let's jump in there. What a, what a mighty, mighty God, God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. Angels bow before him, heaven and earth adore him. What a mighty God we serve. Okay, one more time. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. Angels bow before him, heaven and earth adore him. What a mighty God we serve. Well, we thank you, O oh Lord, as we look into your word and you reveal to us again and again the majesty of your glory, the greatness of your might, and the wondrous majesty of your Son, now resurrected and at your right hand. Help us, O oh Lord, to glimpse just a little bit more of that each day of our lives until the day when we finally see you face to face and see the whole thing. Give us insight and wisdom in our study of Scripture. Help us to, to grow in our appreciation of it, our passion for it, our knowledge of it, and put it to work in our hearts in our mouths and in all of our actions for the sake of Christ and his kingdom, the one into whose kingdom we have called us, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Okay, we finished uh, at verse 7, so I'm going to invite you to turn to Revelation 1, and we're going to pick up then at verse 8. Um, is there a volunteer who wants to read, or should I just read? I always fear that people get sick of hearing my voice after all. <laughs> Okay, I'll, I'll just read it. Ready? Pick it up at verse 8 there. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, saying, Write what you see in a book, and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, and to Smyrna, and to Pergamum, and to Thyatira, and to Sardis, and to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze refined in a furnace, and his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. Write, therefore, the things that you have seen, those that are and those that are to take place after this. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, 
and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Okay, so let's go to verse 8 there. And you see there, who is speaking? The Lord God. The Lord God, right. So, it's the first time in the book now where God speaks. Guess when's the next time in the book that God speaks? Yeah, yeah that's right. Not, not till chapter 21, which is almost to the end of the book. So there, God speaks at the beginning and speaks at the, at the end. Um, it's, these are the two places where we hear his voice. And so how does he introduce himself? I am the Alpha and the Omega. Okay. Well, oh, sorry, folks. We did. We kicked off a little early. Just okay, that's that extra right. time, so you're not late. <laughs> all right. What does what does it mean to be the Alpha and the Omega? What is that? Beginning. Yeah. yeah. Who could explain what? How, why it means the beginning and the end. First and last letter of the alphabet. Yeah. Yeah. In the Greek alphabet, the the first letter is Alpha, and the last letter is. Omega. Um, so it's a way for him to say he is the, 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 the first and the last, the beginning and the end, and everything that's in between is all encompassed by him and by who he is. Um, in fact, the rest of that, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come. Um, that's reminiscent of, of a passage in the Old Testament that's very, very important. Do you remember when Moses saw the burning bush? So he said he turned aside to see this thing, why the bush is not consumed. And he goes and who speaks to him out of the burning bush? God. God sends him to Pharaoh. And Moses says, well, when I go talk to the people, they're going to want to know who sent me? What's the name? What's your name, O oh God? And how did God respond to that? I yeah. am. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, the all-existing one. So here he's kind of, that, that's kind of portrayed again, the one who is and who was and who is to come, the one, the one who is self-existent. Um, now I want you to look at something else, too. So keep this page open in your, in your Bible. We're coming back to it. But flip all the way back to chapter 22, the last chapter in the book. Chapter 22. And would someone read verses 12? And thirteen. So this is the this is the epilogue, right? This is like the closing. This is the final, finishing part of the book, and uh, it starts out with verse twelve. So read verses twelve and thirteen. Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me, to repay each one for what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Okay, who is speaking there? Who is that? I heard two answers. Well, Chris is coming, isn't he? Go to verse 16. Yeah, I, Jesus. So, who's speaking there in this epilogue? That is Jesus. not God, that's Jesus. How do I know it's in red in this Bible? <laughs> no, I know because verse 16 says, I, Jesus. So Jesus is speaking there. So isn't that interesting that in chapter 1, who is the Alpha and the Omega? In chapter 22, he, who is the Alpha and the Omega? Yes. So you see how there's the, 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 the New Testament authors... It's very easy for them to have this confluence of descriptive language about both God and Jesus. Why is that? Because they believed Describe. Jesus was God. 
Yes, because Jesus is also fully God. Um, I don't, yeah, you've been taught that since you were little kids, and I suspect when I say it, I'm looking for people who go, wow! And you're yeah, probably just, yeah. It's like humdrum. Hum yeah, hum yeah. Um, you, you've got to realize in the first century, this concept of Jesus being fully God, um, how dramatic, how powerful that is. And where do we get that from? From the New Testament itself, by the language and, and, and the way it describes him. Him? Yes. Verse 17. So this is this is still God, or like you would say, Jehovah God from the Old Testament or Yahweh. In chapter 22 or chapter? No, uh, in uh, first chapter. In first chapter. Yeah, fear not, I am the first and the last, the living one. I died. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Right. Yeah, when did God die? <clears throat> in Christ. Well, we're going to come to that. Oh, okay. So verse 8 is the Lord God, the Almighty, speaking. But when John has this vision, he's going to see a, see somebody. And uh, well, we may as well since, since you you hit it, let's let's uh, look at it right away. Um, just jumping ahead for a moment to uh, verse twelve, chapter one, chapter one. Yeah, so we're all back in chapter one now. Sorry, hon. Chapter one. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. Well, I, mean, I guess we have to go back to. Chapter verse ten, don't we? So John hears a hears a sound, saying, verse eleven, verse twelve. Then he turns to see the voice that's speaking, and he sees the lampstands. In verse thirteen, and in the midst of the lampstands, he sees one like a son of man. Who is it that he's seeing here in this vision? Jesus. So this is Jesus. And again, how do we know? Like Jim said. Um, in verse 18, this one who is speaking says, I died. Right. Mm -hmm. So, in the doctrine of the Trinity and in our Christology, um, is the Father fully God? Yes. Yeah. yes. Is the Son fully God? Yes. Yeah. Is the Son the same as the Father? No. No. Because did the Father die? No. No. But the, but the Son died, Jesus died, right. So there's a distinction among the perfect, the persons, even though there's no distinction in the in the essence. Um, though, so the more you study the Scripture, the more you see that the doctrine of the, the Trinity, it's all over the place. Um, and it's the only way to explain and understand what the Scripture teaches. It's the, it's the only way to do it. Okay, so now we're going back to verse 9 again. We did verse 8. Look at verse 9. Alright, so I, John, your brother and partner. Now we talked, I think, in our first week about who wrote this book. And I mentioned that there are a lot of scholars, especially on the, the more liberal side of theology, that don't believe this was John the Apostle. But most of us on the, on the more conservative side of theology, Theology see this as John the the apostle. So in John's gospel, he doesn't mention his name. Does anyone? Re well, I, I'm not going to waste time. We got to go faster. Uh, in in his epistles, he doesn't mention his name. But here in Revelation, if this was written, if, if this was the last book written, if all the other of the twelve apostles have been martyred now, John's the last one left. Um, how significant is something that's written by John? Very. It's very significant, right? Yeah. So all he has to do is identify who he is. I, I John. And he doesn't say, I'm, you know, John Schultz or, or yeah. John Smith. Just says, I, John. And that seems to carry with it enough weight to, for people to acknowledge that this is authoritative. This is this is someone really important. So, I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos on account of the, the word of God. So, remember we said that according to tradition, John took Jesus' mother Mary and they ended up in Ephesus 
where he watched out for her. And then according to tradition, um, John ended up being exiled to the island of, of Patmos. So Patmos is off the coast of Asia Minor, not too far from Ephesus. It's a little island. I think it's uh, seven miles or so north and south, and maybe six miles at the widest. But it's not. It's it's kind of shaped funny. It's not that wide all the way down. So it's actually a pretty small little little island. And John, you can see John being sent there. So he'll keep his mouth shut. So he quits creating disturbances and causing problems. He's there on account of what? The Word of God and the testimony of Jesus. So it's because he's been preaching the Word that he's been put on that, that island. Yes? So because he says he was on the island, that means he probably wrote the letters while he was on the island but didn't distribute them until he left? and perhaps look back to Ephesus? Um, I don't know that we need to read that into it. He, he was on the island when this happened. Um, did that mean that he delayed in sending the letter off? I, I, I don't know that it calls for that. And I would suspect no. This is, this is just me talking. I'm kind of limited in my scholarly abilities here, but one of the things that the liberal... Um, theologians point to about this is that his Greek style in the book of Revelation is so different from the Greek style of John's gospel and his epistles. Well, your style changes. If somebody pulled out something you wrote 30 years ago and compared it to something you write now, it's not going to be the same, right? It changes. Um, but another thing that could possibly account for the stylistic difference is if he's writing this down quickly. Um, in other words, he's got this vision, and the, he, he's told later on here to write this down. So he's, he's writing it. Um, you, you don't have time. You know, if you're writing a gospel, you'd say, hmm, how do I want to say this? Let me pray about this for a few days. Let me think about this for a month. And just, I don't know. If, if, but if, if you're seeing this vision and you're trying to write it down, um, it's, it's not going to come out quite the, quite the same. Um, so that's what I suspect, but I don't know. I, I don't know, to be honest. I don't know if anybody knows. Um, so he's on Patmos, and verse 10, it says he was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. All right, so what is the Lord's day? Sabbath. Sabbath, yeah. Well, turn. All right, so let's break those down. I heard different answers. Those are all good, good shots at it. Um, could it be equivalent to what's called in the Bible the day of the Lord? Is the Lord's day the same as the day of the Lord, the day of judgment? Um, that doesn't seem to be the case. Otherwise, this would be the, the day of judgment, and that's not where it's going. Um, it's the only place where it talks about the Lord's day. But that same language, the Lord's something, is only used of one other thing. The Lord's supper. Yeah. Um, so, the idea there, and some have argued this more at length, I don't know if I've, I'm qualified to do it, but that um, the Sabbath would have been what we know of as Saturday, but because Christ rose on Sunday, they began to um, meet together and Christians began to practice the Sabbath on Sundays instead of Saturdays. And one of the things that they did when they met together was take the Lord's Supper. And so Sunday became known as the Lord's Day, which is the kind of language we still use today about it, isn't it? We, we still talk about it the same the same way. So this in all likelihood is on is on Sunday. And it says that he's in the spirit. In the spirit. Now what does that mean? Let's look up a couple passages really fast. Go to Daniel chapter 10, verse 9. Actually, let's split it up. Oh, these first couple of rows, Daniel 10, verse 9. Back two rows over there, John 
18, verse 6. Back two rows over there. Acts 10, verse 10. First two rows up here. Acts 22, verse 17. Daniel 10, verse 9. What was our John chapter? And John 18, verse 6. Acts 10, 10. And Acts 22, 17. We'll just read through these kind of fast. I don't want to spend too much time on this. These are good sword drills, right? You're flipping through your Bibles. This is good. That's good stuff for your for your fingers. Uh, Daniel 10, 9. Okay, would someone read Daniel 10, 9? And I heard the sound of the words, and as I heard the sound of his words, I fell on my face in deep sleep with my face to the ground. All right, so there's Daniel hearing from the word of the Lord, and it says he falls down, and it's like he's in a deep sleep with his face down. Um, in other words, he's, he's kind of out of it in terms of our connection to, to the, the sensory realm around us because he's so in tune now to the spiritual realm um, where he's hearing the words from the, given from the Lord. John 18, verse 6. And Jesus said to them, I am he. They drew back and fell to the ground. So this is the set setting there is Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Maybe you remember this. Judas betrayed him, and so the, the soldiers from the chief priests come to, to arrest Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. And Jesus says, who are you looking for? And they say, Jesus of Nazareth. And he says, I am he. And what did they do? Get him! They fell over. <laughs> in other words, it, it, it's as if his glory, his presence, his word is so powerful and magnified at that moment that they can't stand. They fall to their faces. Um, that, that's kind of powerful, isn't it? Uh, Acts 10, verse 10. And he became hungry and wanted something to eat. So he took bread and gave it to them. But while they were preparing it, he fell into a trance. All right, so that is Peter, um, and it's uh, Peter um, when he has the vision from the Lord, where the sheet is let down and the, the kosher things are, are the non-kosher things. Now he's told he's allowed to eat those, and that happens to him while he is in the way that read was a trance. Before I comment on it, let's have the other verse from Acts two, Acts twenty-two, verse seventeen. Stand. <laughs> hey, when I heard, when I had returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple, I fell into a trance. All right, so this is Paul. So Paul, on this occasion, talks about a time where he's praying in the temple and he falls into a trance. In both of those occasions from the book of Acts, I think it's probably unfortunate that they use the word trance. Um, it's a word that's not used that often in the New Testament. I think only seven times, if I remember. Um, and when we think of a trance in the word in the English language, what do we think of? Uh, yeah, you're kind of like semi, yeah, you're kind of out of it, right? Um, the Greek word there is ecstasis. Does that sound like an English word that you know? Ecstasy. Yeah, ecstasy. Now, you have to be careful. I, you, you, you don't understand a Greek word by looking at an English word that uh, used it as its etymology. That's not the point. But I, I do think when you look at the other places in the New Testament where that word is used, it, 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 the connotation that comes along with the translating it as trance is not good. It's not... Oh, more of an ecstasy, being in an ecstatic state. Like, wow. Wow. This, I'm, yeah, this, he's experiencing. So Peter and Paul are experiencing God showing something to them. So those are all examples, I think, of what could have been happening here to John in verse 10 when he says he was in the Spirit. Um, that as if the Spirit is captivating him in such a way 
that he's experiencing spiritual realities, that they supersede his normal sensory experiences of what's so around him. So he's in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. And second half of verse 10, it says, I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet. So this voice comes to him, and the emphasis there is that it's unmistakable. Like when you, when the Alleluia Brass is playing up in the sanctuary. If you're late for church, and you open the door, and the Alleluia Brass are there, and you forgot that they're coming, um, does it take you like a few minutes to figure out that... You, no, you hear all the way from the back. Right? You can't miss this. So the point here is this is not Jesus speaking to John and saying, if you build it, they will come. It's not, it's not like a soft whisper or something like that. It's an unmistakable, clear voice. Um, and verse 11, what is it saying? Write what you see in a scroll or in a book and send it to the seven churches. And he tells, the, tells John the seven churches there where he wants it sent. So verse 12, um, he turns, John turns to see the voice, and when he turns, he sees seven, lampstands. seven golden lampstands. Good. Uh, verse 13, in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his waist. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace. And his voice was like the roar of many waters. So the, here's a description of G, this Jesus that he sees in his resurrected glory. So... We know that Paul saw Jesus on the Damascus Road, right? Um, who else? I guess the Peter, James, and John would have seen Jesus in his glory um, on the Mount of Transfiguration. But here we get the best description of it. This is John explaining what, what he's seeing. And I want you to see how much he's borrowing from Old Testament language here to help explain it. So let's look for a moment at um, Daniel chapter 7. So keep your finger in Rev 1. We're coming back to that. We'll go to Daniel chapter 7. All right, let's just look at a few of these things from, from Daniel 7. Um, how about verse, verse 9? This is Daniel's vision. As I looked, thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat, and his clothing was white as snow, and his hair was... His hair was white like wool. So what did, what did John say about the hair of Jesus when he sees it? White, like, like white wool, like snow. What would that signify? What's, this, what's the importance of white hair in the Old Testament? Purity. Age and wisdom. Yes, age and wisdom. Um, remember Proverbs, you know, rise up before the hoary head or the white haired person. Um, in other words, honor the old people among you. White hair is a sign of respect and wisdom in the Old Testament. It's a good thing. Not in our day and age. Today, today what we, we got a diet so we don't look too old, right? Because our culture's backwards. Um, but in, in that day, it was a sign of age and wisdom. So to have white hair is to show the, the tremendous age, the respectable age and wisdom of the one that has it here. And it's language that comes right out of the book of, uh, of Daniel. Um, go to verse, in Daniel 7, go to verse 13. In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, 
coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into His presence. So, Daniel's vision is of the Ancient of Days. That would be God. But then he also has the vision of one who's like a son of man. So the son of man is distinct from the Ancient of Days. Um, but he's, he's coming to represent the Ancient of Days. He fulfills the, the requirements of the Ancient of Days. So what was Jesus' favorite designation for himself during his three years of ministry? What did he call himself more than anything else? Son the Son of Man. So Jesus is self-consciously seeing himself as being in this role. And the language here, like I've said uh, in our first week together, Revelation has all these allusions and echoes to the Old Testament. So he's not quoting Daniel, but these are allusions back to the language of Daniel. And like I said, there's like a confluence of descriptions of God and Christ, of the Ancient of Days and the Son of Man. They all kind of blend together. Why? Because Jesus Christ is himself fully God. While you're in Daniel, go to chapter 10. Let's look at chapter 10. Uh, let's look at verse 5. I looked up, and there before me was a man dressed in linen with a belt of fine gold from Ahaz around his uh, waist. So in Daniel's vision here in chapter 10, he sees this one who has this gold belt around his waist. In John's vision, Jesus has a golden sash around his Chest. So it's not exactly the same, but you kind of see it like drawing on these, this imagery from the Old Testament, right? There's similarity there. While you're in Daniel 10, look at verse 6. His body was like topaz, his face like lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, um, his arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze and his voice like the sound of a, of a multitude. So, again, in the language of John's description of Jesus, what do we see? Well, his eyes are not like the flame of torches, but the flame of fire. His, not just his legs are burnished bronze, but his, his feet are burnished bronze, refined in the fire. And his voice is like the sound of, of many waters. Um, while you're in the Old Testament, flip over to Ezekiel 43 for a second. Ezekiel 43. Oh, this is so good for you to be flipping through the Bible. Oh, this is good. This is the best training you're going to have all week long. Ezekiel 43, verse 2. Ezekiel 43, verse 2. So here's in, in Ezekiel's vision. And I saw the glory of the God of Israel coming from the east. His voice was like the roar of rushing waters. So there's this description. This description in the glory of God. What, is it, what does he sound like? <laughs> Have you ever been in rushing waters? Yeah. You, so you know what he's talking yeah. about here, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, Boy, there's more we could look at. It's, it's just neat to see how he draws on all this language. I won't spend a lot more time on it. Um, so when he, he, he sees this one like the Son of Man, the Son of Man is surrounded by something, seven of something. Did you catch that? Seven golden, golden lampstands. See that in verse 12? And where is this this son of one like a son of man in relation to the seven lampstands? In the midst of them. If, if you if you have a church Bible, don't mark it up. <laughs> but if you're using your own Bible, you should underline that. Really, in the midst of them. Um, what are those seven lampstands? In this case, we don't have to guess because he tells us. Go down to verse twenty. 
verse, Revelation 1, verse 20. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are angels. the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are churches. the seven churches. Right. So where is this one like a son of man in relation to the seven lampstands? In, in the midst of them. Right. So what is what is the the in the first chapter of the book of Revelation? What is the central part of John's message? What's he going to be trying to remind people of in this really important book? Christ is where watching you with binoculars from high. Of it. Where is Christ while you're going through tribulation and trouble? He's, in, he's right with you. He's in the midst of you. Yes. Um, he's wearing a long robe. I think we won't take time to look it up, but that, that word for robe there, according to one commentator, is the exact same word from the Greek version of the Old Testament, the Septuagint, that's used always of the priest robes. So the priest robes went how far down? All the way down. Another commentator had a different take on it. I thought this was kind of interesting. Which is true? I don't know. Or could be both are true. But he said in the Roman Empire, the length of your robe was an indicator of your status. So if you were a centurion, your thing was, you know, kind of came down above your knees. If you were a tribune, a little longer. Who's the only one in the Roman hierarchy that wore a robe that was floor length? Caesar. Caesar, yeah. I don't know if that's true, but I thought that was an interesting take on it. Um, verse 16. In his right hand, he held seven stars. Now, we've already seen. What are the stars? They're the angels. Um, the angels of the seven churches. So what does it mean to say that he holds them in his hands? Yeah, he's, he's got them in control. They're in his control. He, he, he's managing them. He's, there. He, 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 he's directing them. He's got his hands on this thing. He's holding it in his, in his hands. Um, and from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. Um, what is the sharp two-edged sword? The Word. The, the Word of God, right. Good. And what do we see about his face, the end of verse 16? Yeah, his face uh, was like the sun shining in full strength. So the glory of the Lord is like staring at the sun sun on a hot day in the middle of the sky. It's just you can't even look upon it. So overpowering. So did you ever meet somebody that's kind of a kind of cocky and a smart aleck and you try talking to them about Christian things or spiritual things and they just they just joke around and, oh yeah, you know, when I get to heaven I'm gonna tell God that he, he really messed up on this or you know, I'll just tell him I you know I did this and that he better be okay with that and they, 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 they talk about it as if they're going to shoot the breeze with God the way they would with some guy down at the local tavern on Saturday night. No. When you see the Lord, you're not going to be able to stand. You're not going to be able to look at Him. You're not going to be able to think of what you were going to say. Um, his glory is that imposing upon us all. Um, so what does John do when he sees this one like a son of man? Verse 17. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. he can't even stand in front of Christ. But what does Christ do? He laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last. Isn't it interesting how often in the Bible it tells us, Fear not. Don't be afraid. That would be our natural reaction in the presence of God. It tells us not to be afraid. He's the first and the last. This is important, verse 18. And the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore. So it's Christ talking. 
because he's died and he's resurrected and he lives now forevermore and he has the keys of death and Hades. What are death and, and Hades? That's one soul. Condemnation to hell. Yeah, death, yeah, death and Hades are a way of describing the, the, our ultimate enemy. When we pass from this life and we're no longer alive um, in any sense that we can understand it. And what does it mean for him to say, I hold the keys to it? Is there a literal, does he have like a little key ring, you know, that he jingles on his belt when he walks? What does it mean to say he has the keys? He has control. He has control, right. He, he can lock and unlock that, that door. Which is why death holds no fear for us as Christians, right? Well, it, Pastor, I'm kind of afraid about it once in a while. <laughs> uh, when I say it holds no fear for, him, for us, I, I'm talking uh, de jure, right? The, it, it shouldn't hold fear for us because our Lord commands death and hell. We're told in 1 Corinthians 15 that that, that, that that'll be the final enemy put underneath his feet, uh, meaning death cannot contain us. So you have no cause to be afraid of, of dying. You're in the Lord's hands. Oh, I get off on tangents and stories. I don't think she'd mind me saying this, because where she is now, she's looking down and she's got a big smile on her face. But our, our dear and wonderful uh, saint from uh, this church, Lois, and when she, in her last couple of weeks of life, I was so privileged to get to. I got. I went to see her almost every day. I didn't make it every day, but almost every day I went. And I just watched her go downhill. You know, by the end, she was not conscious anymore. I would just come and pray over her. Um, she couldn't respond. But at the beginning, especially, she knew she was dying, and she was a little nervous about it. Understandably, right? Um, so she asked me, what's going to happen? And I would explain to her from the Bible what happens for a Christian when they die and why they have no cause to be afraid. You could just see her. It just like strengthened her. Like she was sucking in fresh air after choking on smoke or something. It just buoyed her up and, and, and blessed her. Um, and so that knowledge that our Lord has mastery over death and Hades is so important. There's more Old Testament texts that we could go through. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do all that. But I, I did want to get to this, um, this last section. So verse 19, write therefore the things that you have seen, those that are and those that are to take place after this. In other words, the vision that John has seen, he's supposed to write this down. And the rest of the vision that's going to unfold now in the next 21 chapters after this, um, he's supposed to write that, write that down. It's all part of it. Um, verse 20, as for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand in the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven uh, churches. Um, so we've already seen that Christ is in the midst of his church as we go through tribulation. But what are these seven angels of the seven churches? He holds them in his hands. But what are they? This is much more difficult. And there's no consensus here. No, um, <clears throat> if you were to ask me how sure I am, I would say, I think I know what it is, but I'm not 100% sure. So this is not something you'd kick some, somebody out of the church over, right? <laughs> I'm not having communion with you because you don't believe the same about the seven angels. Um, but what are these seven angels? So here's... a. Uh, Here's four different theories that I was able to gather from the source of all the sources that I was researching. And I'll tell you the one that makes the most sense to me. So one is that these are the, the pastors of the seven churches. So angel literally means one who is sent, right? So who was sent to these seven churches? Why their pastors were, were sent there. So some take the view that um, these angels are the, the pastors of the churches. Next week, when we start getting into the letters to the seven churches from chapters 2 and 3, you'll see that they're all addressed 
to the angel of the church in. So to whom is he writing the letters? To the angels. So some would say that he's writing to the pastors of, of, these, of these churches. Um, I think the, the hard part of that is that there's no place in the Bible where angels or where pastors are called angels, where um, that kind of language is used. Um, a very similar theory to that is the idea that they're the messengers. So the idea behind that is that John writes this letter, Revelation, and then it's going to go out to the seven churches. Every, every church gets not only their own letter, they get the whole thing, right? So each church needs to have somebody who carries this scroll to that church. That, so that would be a messenger or an angel. Um, but there again, that just seems to me kind of speculative. Um, trying, to, trying to think what it is. Another idea is that it's a personification of the spirit of each church. So every church has its own, you could call it a spirit, right? It's kind of the, the, the unseen general flavor of what's going on there. You've experienced this, right? You go to a church and you go there for a little while and you get a sense of how that church is a little bit different from other churches. It has its own internal things going on, its own character. And so um, some would say that John is personifying that invisible spirit with a literal spirit, an angel of the, of, of the church. So that could be, I don't know. Um, but I think the best answer to this is, especially since they're talked about so many times in the book of Revelation, angels, that when it talks about the angels here, that they are angels. <laughs> Imagine that. Um, so we're not told everything in the Bible that we'd like to know about angels. There's a lot about angels that we don't know. But we do seem to know that angels um, seem to have a whole structural hierarchy. There seems to be an entire visible, invis excuse me, invisible world um, of the spiritual beings that we can't see. We only get glimpses of it through through Scripture. But there's a lot more more to it. So, for example. Um, the idea of guardian angels. So I, I just taught this a couple weeks ago to my confirmands. This was the lesson for the confirmands when we talked about angels. I said, is, do you have a guardian angel? And again, this is not a doctrine. I wouldn't kick someone out of the church if they disagree over this. I hope they wouldn't kick me out. It's not that, it's not that critical. But I think as we study the scripture, the idea is, yes, we do have guardian angels. Let's split up and look up a few verses again, okay? So the first two rows over here, Acts 12, verse 15. The back two rows, Matthew 18, verse 10. The back two rows here, Psalm 34, verse 7. And the front two rows, Psalm 91, Oh, I can't read my own writing. I think that's 19, but I'll double check it with you. So Acts 12, verse 15, Matthew 18, verse 10, Psalm 34, verse 7, and Psalm 91, verse... i got to look it up. Okay. <laughs> I can't read my own writing. That's, and Dawn will tell you, that's not a sign of my aging. I've never had writing. <laughs> it can't be verse 19. Uh, it's got to be verse 11. So it's, it's Psalm 91, verse 11. Okay, Acts 12, verse 15. They said to her, You are out of your mind. But she kept insisting that it was so. And they kept saying, It is his angel. Alright, so this is where Peter was imprisoned. 
And the Lord opens up the prison and Peter comes out and he goes to the house where all the Christians are meeting and the maid answers the door and, you know, she opens the door and it's Peter. And Peter's supposed to be in jail, you know, and she slams the door and runs back. Ah, oh, I just saw Peter. And they're like, That's, that can't be Peter. No, it must be his angel. Yeah, the idea there that it's the spiritual um, reflection of, of him somehow. Um, how about Matthew 18, verse 10? <clears throat> See that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. Okay, that's an interesting verse, isn't it? The little children, um, don't despise them. One of the reasons you shouldn't despise them is their angels. So the implication there is that they have an angel assigned to, assigned to them who has direct access to the, to the Heavenly Father. That's interesting, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Psalm 34, verse 7. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. All right. So uh, the idea that the angel is there to protect and take care of the follower of the Lord. My mom used to joke when I was a kid because I used to go out and play, you know, and I'd be climbing over the fences and my pant leg would catch and it would rip my leg and my pants open and then Play I would jump the creek, across the creek and I'd, I'd try to jump and I didn't quite make it and my feet would go down you know and I'd cut covered with mud and then I'd climb a tree and I'd scrape my face on the bark and, and I'd come home and my mom used to say well oh, no your angel when we get to, be, to heaven it'll be the one that's all torn and tattered and ragged looking with bent wings and <laughs> um, but the idea there is that you have an angel that looks out for you, and is assigned to yeah. care for you. For you. Um, Psalm 91, verse 11. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. Alright, so that's kind of the classic verse of guarding mm -hmm. angels. The, one, the verse that Satan quotes to, to Jesus when he's being tempted too, that there's an angel assigned to, to take care of you and guard you in all your ways. Um, so the idea there is that there are angels assigned to individuals. So what about this idea possibly then that there might be angels assigned also to corporate bodies, larger groups? Um, here's something kind of interesting to look up. Let's go back to Daniel chapter 10. Daniel chapter 10. Daniel 10, and let's go to, let's just go to verse 12 for now. So Daniel has been praying, I can't remember, does anyone remember how long he had been, oh it's, it's mentioned here, uh, 21 days. So Daniel has been praying earnestly, and now all of a sudden um, an angel appears to him and answers him. So verse 12, then he continued. Do not be afraid, Daniel. Since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I have come in response to them. But the prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me twenty-one days. Then Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me because I was detained there with the king of Persia. Now I have come to explain to you what will happen to your people in the future, for the vision concerns a time yet to come. Um, so the idea there is that when, it, when Daniel started to pray, God dispatches this angel to give him the message. But it takes 21 days for Daniel to get the message. Why? Because the angel's being resisted by the prince of Persia. Now, do you think that this was the literal, physical prince of Persia? How, how, how could he resist an angel? So, so this is generally understood as though the prince of Persia is actually a spiritual being, a, a demonic angel that manages and oversees 
the, the kingdom of Persia. And so there's, we know from Ephesians chapter 6, right, that we are, the battles of our warfare are not carnal, um, but we, we battle against powers and principalities in the heavenly places. There's a spiritual battle going on around us all the time. So the idea seems to be there that there's this demon, a big demon in charge of Persia, and when God sends the angel, he fights, he fights against them until another angel comes, the angel Michael. And again, I don't know if this is from the scripture, I don't think it is, but I think it's tradition that Michael is seen as the guardian angel of Israel, the Jews. So Daniel's in Persia, and the angel coming to him is resisted by the angel, uh, the, the, the prince of Persia, until the guardian angel of Daniel and, and Israel comes to help that angel and battle against him. And now the now the the battle comes. Uh, sk skip over while you're in chapter 10 there for a second to just down to the end, verse 20. Verse 20. So he said, Do you know why I have come to you? Soon I will return to fight against the prince of Persia. And when I go, the prince of Greece will come. Uh, but first I will tell you what is written in the book of truth. No one supports me against them except Michael, your prince. All right, so Michael is... Daniel's prince, um, the, the angel is battling the prince of Persia, and in the absence of the prince of Persia, there's going to be the incoming of the prince of Greece, right? It is, it's, so the picture there, I think, is of both, both evil spirits and good angels that, are, that oversee not just individuals, but corporate bodies. So... Could there be like the Prince of Chicago? <laughs> yeah. What do you think the Prince of Chicago is like? Let's see if we can get a thousand murders this year. Let's see. No, it's destructive, right? Um, so are there evil spirits out there? Over, over things? Sure. And then, so wouldn't it make sense then that there could also be good spirits, good angels that God has appointed over his people? So Michael was the, the prince over the Israelites or over the Jews or assigned to care for them. Um, could there be and, and could there be then an angel of Ephesus and an angel of the church of Pergamon and an angel of the church at Laodicea? And could there be an angel of the church of hope in Twin Cities? I I think so. I, I really kind of do. And that's very comforting for me to think that when the things are going off in the middle of the dark, <laughs> that there's still God's guardian protective angel is assigned here. Yes, so, uh, comments or discussion or disagreement? Well, some of the churches you have today, I mean, you wouldn't think there's an angel there. I mean, Joel Olstein, he's got a bag of goodies up there. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what kind of churches are these? As far as, you know, we preach the word we institute with the sacraments are done yeah. properly. The ones that aren't doing that, what is going on with that angel there? Um, I, I would have to say we don't know. I mean, there, like I said at the beginning, there's a lot about the structures and the hierarchy and the activity and assignments of angels that we're just not told. So does every single visible church have a, an angel assigned to it? Maybe, maybe not. I, I, I'm not sure. Um, there are some of the churches we'll see here when we go through chapters 2 and 3 of Revelation. They're not all 100% pure and right on their doctrine, and yet it is being assigned to their angels. So, um, you know, is there a gray area in between? Um, I, I, we don't know. But I find it fascinating to, to consider that. Um, so, you know, the devil has a staff meeting, and he calls all his big wig demons into the meeting, and they all report on their territories. And the demon of that's been assigned to South Wisconsin says, yeah, there's this little upstart church in Twin Lakes, and... And they're they're believing the gospel down there, and they quit fighting with each other, and they love each other, and they're they're sharing the word of God, and people are hearing, and they'll just, don't, well, it's up to you. 
take care of it. So, you know, that demon goes and gets another demon and says, all right, I want you to attack the pastor. And I want you to I want you to attack the head elder. And I get another one, you're going to attack George. And another one, you're going to make Mrs. Mrs. Uh, Smith really, really sick. You know what? That's why we pray for the pastor and we pray for each other. I, really? Yeah. I, I could perceive of that being true. Yeah. Sounds like screw tape letters. It's kind of like the yeah. screw tape letters. Yeah. 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 And, and I, you know, I'm just being very speculative about this. You know, I, I don't want to present this as though it's all sure and solid and certain fact. But we're trying to get a glimpse of the spiritual world by seeing little. It's like trying to look at a jigsaw, a thousand piece jigsaw puzzle and... There's 150 pieces in there. Now tell me what the picture is. Um, so we're, that's what we're trying to do here. So we don't want to, I don't want to overstate the case or push it too far, but it does, it does make sense to me. So I think these angels are probably actual angels that are assigned to these churches. All right, I, I took you over. I, we started early and I went late. I do apologize for that. But I hope you'll join us again next week and we'll start on chapter 2 and begin digging into these letters to the churches. Lord, bless your people in Christ. Care for them. Pour out your grace upon them this week. Amen. Thanks, everyone.